Welcome to the Australian Water School, the home of demand-driven industry design training for the global water sector. Hi, and welcome to today's webinar addressing plastic pollution in waterways and in the ocean. I'm your host, Craig Price, with the International Water Training Institute, and together with the Australian Water School, we're very excited today to be bringing you an all-star cast of advocates, activists, and scientists who have dedicated their careers to raising awareness of the issues associated with plastics in our waterways and investigating the opportunities to start solving the problem and uh, how we can do better. So with that, let's get um, an introduction out to all of you. Thank you so much for registering. We've got people from a number of countries uh, all around the world, over 500 attendees here live. And welcome also to those of you who will tune in to watch this recording later on. That's a truly global audience and this is a truly global problem. So thank you for your attendance today. Let's introduce to you our uh, expert panel for today. If you can all turn on your cameras, your microphones, let's have everybody say hello. We've got Bo Miles, Charles Moore, Kathy Willis, Brad Delrapil and Brad Clark. So the two Brads, Brad D and Brad C that we'll be uh, talking with today. We've got just a range of expertise that everybody covers in their backgrounds, in their careers that I hope will add some value to this well-rounded discussion about the issues and potential solutions around plastics. So let's uh, just kind of go around the room a bit and um, have you introduce yourselves, tell us a little bit about where you're coming to us from today and how you got into this business and how long you've been doing what you do. And let's start, um, we'll start with Bo Miles. Um, uh, let's uh, let's have you say good day and um, let, let us know a little bit about yourself. Good day, Cray. Uh, I'm sitting in my co-producer's kitchen in uh, about an hour or so out of Melbourne. Uh, I'm a Victorian Australian and I'm a filmmaker, writer, ex-academic. Uh, I'm, I'm bad at cooking eggs for some reason. I keep trying and I'm getting slightly better but not as good as I should be. Uh, and yeah, I'm a I'm a kind of a um, a guerrilla filmmaker, and and a lot of my films tend to lead me to water. I'm a sea kayaker by trade. Uh, I, I love water travel, and, and I'm, I'm I love the environment. And I never realised that either. I'm kind of a emergent activist, and so that's becoming part of my identity. And I, I never really meant it to be, but um, yeah. So so here I am. I'm a YouTuber these days, and that's pretty much where my bread and butter is. Uh, otherwise, I'm writing books off to the side. Excellent. Well, great to hear from you. Uh, we'll look forward to seeing some screenshots from your work uh, momentarily. Uh, Charles Moore, Captain Moore, let's uh, have you introduce yourself. Uh, tell us a little bit about your background. Well, I'm uh, Captain Charles Moore, the founder of uh, Algalita Marine Research and Education, and also the Moore Institute more recently for Plastic Pollution Research. I've dedicated my career to uncovering, uh, so I what I call uh, drawing back the plastic curtain of ignorance on the uh, material that defines our era. We live in the plastic age, and yet uh, there's a plastic curtain of ignorance that surrounds uh, the material which we use most in our lives. I, I like to say that next to sleep, the most biggest waste of time you have is unwrapping things wrapped in plastic. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, uh, I've done research, I've done exploration, uh, and now I'm a lab rat. Uh, I'm, I'm becoming uh, involved in accreditation of microplastics and drinking water, uh, I think is going to be a very important topic because uh, when plastics uh, at the large scale become small plastics, they enter the biosphere itself, which includes all of us, our bodies, and the meaning of um, health consequences of having a teeny tiny little piece of plastic invading your bodily tissues is something that people are beginning to become concerned about. So that's where my focus is today. All right. And I think that's uh, we're hoping to help share that purpose. We are drawing back the curtain. We're not going to uh, hold back on, you know, when we talk about ideas, you know, we're going to have a very lively discussion about where should our efforts go. And uh, we will draw back the curtain on some of the uh, myths around plastics. Kathy, um, let's have you introduce yourself. Let us know where you're coming to us from this morning. Yeah, I'm Dr. Kathy Willis. I'm coming from a little town in the northwest coast of Tasmania, the island just south of Australia. 
and I work at the CSIRO, which is Australia's national um, science agency. And my work looks at finding litter on the beaches and looking at the sources and drivers of that, but then also looking at what our governments are doing, looking at policy and waste management responses and seeing which of those are working best to reduce how much rubbish we find on our beaches. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Perfect. That's a very valuable service these days and will become ever more valuable as we continue to increase uh, our plastic usage, which, uh, you know, part of our intents today is to uh, potentially reverse some or help uh, raise awareness of the benefits of reversing those trends. Brad D, uh, let's hear a little bit about you. Brad D, that's me. Thanks, Craig. Good morning, all. Uh, greetings from beautiful Brisbane. I, in, I am an environmental engineer. I work for a company called Ocean Protect, and we basically stop pollution going into our oceans and waterways through stormwater treatment assets. So we install them and manage them. Uh, I'm also an adjunct lecturer at Griffith University. I've been doing that for 16 years now. Uh, and obviously just love the ocean. I uh, love swimming in it. Uh, I'm a triathlete, so I, I'm out, always out and about and um, splashing around. So and pretty keen to drop some truth bombs here today so looking forward to it <laughs> yeah all right you would yeah you wouldn't want to have your triathlon in some of the waterways that mm -hmm. boats encountered but um oh t but um also your role then uh with, with the company uh can you add also your role as a podcaster slash oh, yes. uh, webinar host Sh shameless plug yeah so we, we we get involved in a whole bunch of educational initiatives uh including uh the podcast we're about 100 and 30 something episodes deep now. Um, and we do a bunch of webinars. It's really just about um, raising awareness about how to um, better protect our oceans and waterways with a particular focus on um, stopping pollution at the source before it gets into our oceans and waterways. Perfect. And rounding out our uh, bunch today, uh, Brad Clark, Brad C. G'day everybody. Yeah, my name is Brad. I'm the lead investigator at the Australian Laboratory for Emerging Contaminants here at the University of Melbourne. So I'm based in Melbourne. Um, my area of research looks at um, contaminants in the environment, particularly ones that accumulate in the human body and then cause a range of health effects, including cancers, reproductive health problems, impaired intelligence, amongst others. Um, we've done a range of studies on microplastics, but we also work on the chemicals that plastics carry. So the plasticizers and the pesticides and the flame retardants. Okay, perfect. Well, that's, uh, again, you can see the deep expertise here. I mean, between us all, we've got, um, you know, probably, uh, or between, between the expert panelists here, I, I think you'll see over 100 years worth of experience in this field. Um, what you'll see coming up here, and um, feel free to comment on this, any of the panelists uh, uh, on, on the call at the moment, um, we're going to see the poll results. So uh, we do have a lot more of uh, representation from government policy and planning than we typically do on our technical webinars about uh, flood modeling and that sort of a thing. So welcome to any new attendees uh, who are coming to us from that sector. Well, what uh, we wanted to also highlight here a little bit, um, and you'll see some slides with uh, some data and then some opinion polls as well about the biggest sources of plastic pollutions. So um, stormwater runoff uh, seems to be right at the top, um, and you'll see that those results compared to some other poll results uh, later on, and uh, that uh, and and. We'll also discuss uh, how accurate that might be and where some other efforts might be involved in trying to uh, get academics to even agree on the actual proportions. So when we're going to have a couple of terms here, and we wanted to put those on here um, in terms of gross pollutants. We'll, we'll mention that word, and we'll also talk microplastics. So we wanted to see what these thresholds, uh, what, what everybody perceives these thresholds to be, and then our scientists will talk about what the adopted, uh, where there is consensus, what the adopted thresholds are. So gross pollutants being above one, five, or 10, and then microplastics being less than uh, so many microns or one millimeter or five millimeter. So um, we'll probably address that question right off the bat um, in, in going forward, but uh, let's hit the last question. Uh, what proportion of the plastic in our oceans is at the surface? Um, so how much of the plastic that's out there is, is floating up at the top. If you look at that vertical water column, um, how is it distributed? And we'll, uh, we, we, we won't give you some answers quite yet. Um, we'll talk about that uh, going forward uh, throughout the next uh, 50 minutes or so. Um, and hopefully by the end of this, you, you, you may be surprised at um, uh, how much floats and how much sinks and how much is just suspended in the water column. 
so with that, uh, what I'll do here is share my screen briefly to show you a couple of background uh, resources, and then we'll start going around the room and uh, having some uh, discussions. What you'll see here is a website called hydroschool.org slash plastic, which I've set up just with today's content on it. Um, if you got a chance to take our poll here, thank you for your submittal. Um, if you didn't, you can feel free to go there now and uh, and cast your votes. Uh, we'll talk about those results momentarily. We've got introductions to the people who are joining us today, the filmmaker, the podcaster, the captain himself. Um, we, these resources here, this is a static image of some of the resources I had on there this morning, but this is not going to stay as it is. I want to keep adding to this. I want more research, uh, more results, whatever we discuss today um, and results that are coming out in the future um, that help further the science. I'm going to keep adding them to this website. So if you watch this YouTube recording a year or two from now, you know, maybe the situation has improved, maybe it's gotten worse, but we'll have some additional research posted here to back that up. So again, for those who filled out the poll question, who is your favorite captain? We've got a few captains here that uh, may be in your lingo, that may be familiar to you in pop culture and in real life and history. Um, who is your favorite captain? Let me just share with you the results. I think they were stacked by Star Wars fans because I didn't put a, a, a block on the number of times you could vote. And there were some people who just voted solo, solo, solo over and over again. So um, Han Solo won out. Jack Sparrow was a close second. Um, Captain Quint there, um, don't mistake him for uh, Captain Moore. I did slip Captain Captain Moore into this one. I was surprised there weren't more votes for Captain Morgan. Um, but uh, anyway, those were the top two, uh, Solo and Sparrow. But I hope by the end of today, um, you've got a new favorite captain, Captain Charles Moore, again, who has dedicated his career to some fantastic um, causes that uh, we are well in need of drawing the curtain back on. So uh, with that, what I'm going to do, uh, you know, we will we, really refer back to some of these images during our uh, discussion, but I'll start the discussion out here by having um, uh, talking about some of the homework, which we had. Typically, we'll come here and do a presentation, and then you might ask questions about the, uh, the presentation. In this case, we asked you um, on our last webinars and in the mailers um, to have a look at this documentary that Bo Miles put together called Bad River, and uh, come with your questions for Bo. So what I'll have uh, Bo do, first of all, is just tell us a little bit about what led you to this journey, um, what you encountered on your journey, and uh, where this program is going. Do you, unfortunately, it doesn't look like this is a one-off. There might be a few other bad rivers uh, that you may be traveling in the future. So Bo, over to you. I'll just flip through some of the slide reel here um, while you're talking and uh, give us a little bit of an introduction into the, the, the background for this film uh, enterprise here. Thanks, Craig. Uh, yeah, look, the Bad River Project, and this is episode one of four that will be coming out over the next uh, three or four months, five months. The films are all uh, completely shot and, and, and are all in various stages of being created or being made. And it's all come about, you know, I'm a 42-year-old bloke who's found himself to be really lucky in life. Uh, you know, white, male, educated, living in Australia, beautiful patch of countryside. And I never considered, uh, one, I suppose, just how lucky I am until I, I decided when I was about 35, 36, so I was working as an academic at the time at Monash University. I thought I'm going to paddle to work one day. And, I, you know, I was filmmaking on the side of being an academic. And I, it took me four full days to get down my boyhood river, which turned into a drain, which turned into a, a sea or a port. And then I went up back up a creek to get to my university. And it took four full days. And for the most part, let's say 90% of my journey of that four full days, and I was very late to work, by the way. Everyone asks, Bo, how come you were still able to work there when you were so late to work? That's an odd question to ask, but, but kind of practical as well. Um, most of what I saw was completely sick. Uh, my boyhood river, the drain, even the mangroves and the, the sea, and then back up the creek and then and then all the waterways, the small little tiny tributaries, even the water on the side of the road, getting back to my university was uh, was sick. And, and, it's, and it occurred to me that for such a fundamental element in our world and it's the sustenance of us, we are made of water, we all require it, it's the one thing we require, require at least in the short term, um, and for health. It's, a, it's amazing just how much you take water for granted when you're a lucky white bloke living in a nice patch of the world. And so 
Bad River was born, I thought rather than go to all these beautiful places around the world, which I'm, I'm attracted to as an outdoor type, uh, you know, beautiful mountaintops, wilderness, places where humans don't go or don't often go, or even seas where you can't see the microplastic or the bags underneath you. It's this sort of somewhat gentrified space or, or seemingly gentrified space that is seemingly healthy. I thought, why don't I go to the worst, sickest places in Australia? So I picked the worst urban river, the worst wild river, uh, a, a river most affected potentially by climate change, which is the, the image you just saw running in the desert, uh, and our biggest and our most contested waterway, which is, of course, the Murray River in Australia, 14th largest river in the world, or at least longest, not by volume by any stretch. Um, and so these, and, and the tension here too, Cray, is that these aren't bad rivers. They're, they're, they're unhealthy rivers made unhealthy by human action. Uh, and that's really disappointing. I suppose the only silver lining is that if we've made them sick, we can probably make them unsick. Uh, and that's why I've, it's, my film series is not a call to action because I don't want to tell people how to suck eggs. I just want to go and have experiences in these places uh, in a sense to show off these inspired landscapes that are in some form of sickness. So yeah, the, the film series will come out in the next um, in the next three to six months. The next one is uh, in the Queen River in Tasmania, which is biologically dead uh, and considered the, the worst river in Australia. And that was a shocking experience and, and a hard film to make because I was, I was kind of pissed off most of the time. I couldn't believe that I was part of humanity that would make something so bad. Um, so that's kind of my shtick and what I'm about. Well, great. Yeah, and 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 we're going to have that dichotomy going on today where there uh, there's some pessimism and some uh, optimism at the same time. So yes, uh, we've all been part of this system. We've all contributed more than we should have in terms of the plastic pollution. Uh, but when you look at some of these things, like if I scroll back here to the uh, this image here, um, you know, the, this the, this red plastic ball that you see here that's sitting there. Um, when you posted this video, you know, if you're standing there in this little, you know, I, I don't know if any other eyes had seen this little, uh, you know, grove of uh, pollution here um, when you encountered it. Um, but if you imagine the MCG, you know, the uh, in, in, in Melbourne, 100,000 fans standing around there, you know, watching uh, watching a footy match, um, you know, and you put the put the ball out there in the middle and you got 100,000 people looking at that balls within a, a week or two, uh, you had a million views on this. And so you've basically taken that ball there and put it in the middle of 10 MCGs. And we've got a million people who have tuned in and seen that and gone, wow. And I think initially the reaction is this is this looks like, you know, um, you know, a, an underdeveloped place where infrastructure is not in place. And, you know, boy, they better get their act together. Well, that's that's us here. Uh, nobody on the planet is innocent of these things. Um, it, could you have imagined back then uh, when you were filming this? Um, you know, I th I'm not sure if this has been your most successful video in terms of number of views, but um, did you think this was going to take off the way it did? I didn't think, uh, yeah, I've had, I've got a lot more views in other videos, but not in that amount of time. So yeah, that, that, that went quite rapidly quickly. And that's got a lot to do with maybe the thumbnail, a, an image very similar to that. Yes. And a title, uh, something along the lines of kayaking the, the sickest urban river in Australia. That's a very clickable thing. And, but it was very true too. And when you see it with an image like that, that's quite a good combination to get people across the line to click on you, which is half the, the, the trouble, Craig. We all know there's a problem out there, but you've got to get it onto people's palatable plate. Or yes. it's got to, you've got to give them an interest point. And so I'm using the demise of our environment based on our actions in some respects, not so much to earn a living, but I'm certainly using it as a crutch point to, to tell good stories that are potentially volatile and, and clickable. And I think that's great. Let's give these rivers a voice because uh, one, I can have a really unique experience down these rivers and, and it might lead to me talking on a panel of experts like this. Uh, so, so that's a good thing. Yeah, excellent. Well, what we wanted to do is kind of start upstream then go downstream a bit and show, you know, the next flood event comes through or a big flood event comes through and all of that material that you saw there will be mobilized. Where's it going to go? 
So this is where um, enter uh, Captain Charles Moore, and uh, we, we're going to you know have have uh, uh, Captain Moore explain a little bit about his efforts uh, here here, and then we'll just open it up to the to the panel discussion. Um, so here is uh, Captain Moore um, meeting uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger and his uh, wife Maria Shriver here um, at uh, at an event in California. Um, Captain Moore, can you tell us a little bit about your girly man hat there that you're wearing? Uh, it's uh, woven from plastic bags uh, uh, and now has photodegraded to the point where I can't wear it anymore. So uh, <laughs> we do try to recycle, but uh, recycling uh, in, a, in an artistic manner, making something beautiful out of something ugly, still has uh, time decay uh, involved and, uh, you know, um, unfortunately, that uh, was uh, the, the turtle on that hat was uh, so I, I asked, uh, well, I was in Melbourne and I asked uh, the audience uh, who presented me with the, the turtle woven out of plastic bags, if it matched the color on the hat, if, if she could attach it to the hat and, and she did. So I have a turtle from Melbourne and a, and a hat from my niece. Uh, and uh, those two items are no longer serviceable. They've become uh, uh, microplastics. So there uh, you go. That's now, scale. Uh, so what, what, what are you pointing to here? Um, in, in this, uh, just uh, before, sorry uh, to interrupt you there, but what, what, yeah. what were you pointing to here? Well, these are the microplastics. This is the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. This is a sample from the North Pacific Subtropical Gyre, which has come to be known as the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. And uh, thus a trawl sample from my vessel, you know, was built in Hobart, Tasmania, launched in 1995, came up the east coast of Australia as a, co as a, uh, a coast care program uh, sponsored by Surfrider and, and the uh, government of uh, Australia. And uh, we didn't know at that time that we were dealing with microplastics. It, it required me to have this uh, epiphany after crossing the Great Pacific Garbage Patch and coming back and, and trawling a net through there that what we were dealing with was the breakdown products of plastics. Uh, and, and this is me telling uh, Arnold and Maria about this process and how insidious it is and how difficult it is to, to deal with. And uh, let me talk a little bit about rivers. Uh, you know, when we think of coastlines, we think of coastlines um, after uh, the river has discharged because rivers, uh, water is downhill from everywhere. If you think about it, the, the shores of the river actually are part of the coastline because when those plastics that were shown in the preceding clip uh, that had the balls and so on, when those are mobilized and, and washed downstream and, and enter the great ocean, they do it as if they were part of the coastline. If you just kind of follow the rim of the ocean uh, up the stream, you are realizing that those sides of that river is part of the coastline. And when that uh, then discharges, uh, you're discharging really uh, the upstream coastline onto the rest of the coast. And in general, the eastern shores uh, have onshore flow and the western shores have offshore flow, like the Tohoku tsunami. It was only six months after the Tohoku tsunami that big floats uh, washed up in uh, Vancouver uh, and Seattle, Washington. So there's a, a, a tendency uh, for drift to go from, uh, that's the way the, the, the jet streams travels from uh, west to east, and, and that's how this stuff will move. Uh, it will, we consider a, a, as these uh, items uh, drift down a stream, as they inevitably will, uh, that uh, if we're going to capture them at all and divert them from the ocean, which has really no chance of uh, catching them and, and, and bringing them back, except in a very small percentage, uh, the, the, the last chance for capture is at the mouths of these urban rivers that discharge all this uh, anthropogenic debris, which is what we call, you know, basically single use plastics, plastics that have a very short lifespan and, and now are so cheap because of the price of virgin plastic material 
uh, being made from petroleum and the pivot from uh, petroleum as uh, fuel for transportation to petroleum as plastic, that pivot is now packaging everything in plastic and that packaging has no afterlife. So here we are with an ocean uh, accumulating uh, these plastics that have been swept off the coastlines and down the rivers. And they, due to uh, the kind of bathtub effect of the currents bouncing off the coasts of the, uh, the continents, uh, they tend to concentrate in a circular fashion at the north and south uh, subtropical gyres, uh, north and south of the equator. So I've uh, personally uh, sampled the South Pacific garbage patch uh, off of uh, your coast uh, in Australia and the North Pacific garbage patch off of uh, halfway between Hawaii and California. So what you need to know is that these materials are not static. Uh, they are in a constant process of breakdown, just like my hat that we talked about with Arnold Schwarzenegger. Those plastics are photodegrading. The ultraviolet properties of sunlight and the hydrolytic properties of seawater cause scission. The chains of the polymers break with chain scission. They break into smaller and smaller particles and they become microplastics. Then as biological processes take over, those smaller plastics become heavier proportionately than the macroplastics, the big plastics, and tend to settle into the water column and then eventually uh, on the bottom. So uh, what uh, will happen with all those uh, nice uh, balls that have value and could be recycled, be given to uh, children to play with again, uh, if they're not captured and, and, and reused, uh, they're going to become microplastics, and those microplastics then will become even smaller and reach the nanoscale, in, in which point they become uh, bioavailable uh, to every living organism, whether it's plant or animal. And so that's why we have so much to think about, so much to talk about, and so much to do uh, yes. to stop the plastic attack and push back against the plastic plague in our ocean. Awesome. Well, that that is a great summary. We, we, you know, we debated um, playing some of your TED talks, uh, playing some excerpts from it. We debated playing Bad River. You know, it's a 20 minute video. It, uh, we could play that as part of this um, webinar. But um, because we wanted to take advantage of the live time with you with uh, for this discussion, we're going to link everybody to it. If you didn't get a chance to watch some of these, um, go ahead and uh, and do that. You know, I've got these links right here where you can click on these individual clips where you can see uh, Captain Moore's TED Talks um, and the presentations on this for more details and um, you know also to uh, to Bo's videos there. I'll just point out a couple of other things before we open it up to the panel. After the slide here that we saw with uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, um, I've got this thing that I've grabbed here uh, that uh, you've got a link to in that website as well. Um, Dave Letterman kept calling you George, not sure why, but uh, they, he finally got the name right in the end. You know, raising awareness, this is something that um, is just just as important as you know what we do in our in our work is, you know getting funding and getting awareness of the issues out there uh, is is something that we all could use some help with and that will help yeah. for the cause can you tell us a little bit about uh, this image here and what's involved yeah. uh, if anybody here has crossed the the uh, the equator um, what's involved here well you know after visiting Chile uh, being invited to speak there uh, in advance of uh, the Secretary of State of the United States uh, having a, a presence there uh, and uh, being invited. Uh, I saw in Chile uh, the coastline and talked to the Cientificos de la Pasura, the, the scientists studying trash that had, by citizen science, monitored the entire coastline of Chile, taken uh, scientific samples of quadrats of debris on the entire coastline of Chile. And I realized uh, they needed to see what was going on in their garbage patch. Uh, there'd been just one short cruise through the area uh, and they, I wanted to get deep into it because I'd been deep into the North Pacific garbage patch. So I, uh, as I have that uh, magnificent vessel, the ORV Algita, the little kelp plant, uh, that was uh, uh, Sally Curry in Tasmania did the logo for. Uh, 
we took that vessel, we got a volunteer crew together with commanders from the Coast Guard and Whaleman Chile there, the guy uh, with the bun on top, uh, poking his head through a ghost net. We retrieved a ghost net. And there's a ritual when you cross the equator for the first time, if someone is uh, there as we cross the equator, uh, they are called a polywog before they cross the equator. And there's a, a hazing ritual in which they become shell bats. And this is the hazing ritual when they're threatened, their squid guts and uh, fish guts or bilge water sprayed over them. Uh, they get grease put on them. And then eventually uh, they become shellbacks as our GPS shows that we have gone from uh, uh, the equator uh, from the south uh, to the north. So uh, <laughs> this, uh, I, I'm uh, uh, having the, the, the role of King Neptune there with my uh, gaff and my trident and the hat woven uh, by Corey uh, of Amsterdam on my head. I made also out of plastic bags uh, <laughs> to threaten these uh, uh, polywogs and make them become shellbacks. Of course, <laughs> keel hauling is out of fashion, so we didn't keel haul them, but uh, they certainly uh, got a taste of uh, what it's like to be a sailor in the middle of the equator, which means that you're um, roasting, basically. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That uh, yeah, it sounds like something either uh, a mix between something from pirate folklore and uh, and SpongeBob. But uh, no, that's that's great. Thanks for that anecdote. Um, what we'll do here, I'll just pop up a few uh, images here that uh, might you know bring a bit of a somber tone to the uh, you know to the to, to the fun bits. It's okay to enjoy your job even when you're doing something that uh, you know potentially has these sorts of consequences. Um, you know there there is a reason why we do what I what we do, and um, you know the, the these are the, some of the images straight from uh, Captain Moore's TED Talks. So have a look at those. Um, and, you know, the scale of things here, you know, you zoom in on this. When we think about how many plastic beverage bottles are being produced and, you know, is there something we can do to help legislation, um, you know, to prevent this from being uh, our, our future. I, I imagine, you know, everybody who complained about plastic bags, uh, you know, being limited in certain areas, if you ever went to a turtle and tried to pull this out of its mouth and see what it's doing to the insides, you know, maybe you, there wouldn't be so many complaints about the inconvenience of uh, banning, uh, banning plastic bags. Uh, what we'll do now, uh, Brad D, uh, let's have you, um, I'm, I'm going to flip forward to a couple of things here on, uh, on our poll results. Um, the biggest source of plastic pollution in the world's ocean. So we saw that poll. Um, here's the poll results uh, right now that uh, from a poll that uh, that you were citing in um, in a uh, webinar that we've got a link to that I encourage everybody to watch. Um, you saw those results from today's audience. Um, did we do any better, or do we actually even know the answer? Do we know who's uh, who's nailed the answer here any better? Look, I think we did better for sure. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> just some context. We did an independent survey in the beginning of 2019, uh, a thousand survey recipients, randomized survey, all demographics, all locations across Australia. And we asked them this question that you guys were asked before, you know, what is the biggest source of pollution in our world's oceans? And long story short, people just don't know. Um, you know, it was more or less split between the four options, stormwater, litter at the beach, commercial fishing nets and sewage. Uh, I think I saw uh, a lot of people uh, correctly identified it was stormwater was the uh, key source. And yeah, there's a whole bunch of science nowadays to to demonstrate that 80% of all plastic in our oceans comes from land-based sources. And uh, the key mechanism as to how it gets there is certainly when it rains, it washes our streets, our roads, our urban environments clean, but that uh, pollution has to go somewhere. And unfortunately... It goes into our uh, creeks and rivers and uh, and often in our oceans, uh, hence yeah. why when Bo goes for a kayak down the uh, uh, river in Sydney, he sees a lot of that pollution. So, yeah. yeah, a lot of pollution goes into our oceans and certainly our creeks and rivers often act like sinks as well, uh, unfortunately, uh, which obviously causes a whole bunch of dramas as well. Yeah, no, thanks. Thanks for that. Um, what One of the things we want to point out today is the um, the scales of what it takes to prevent uh 
plastics from getting into the waterways in the first place versus the effort involved in trying to get them out once they're in the waterways and can be mobilized by the next flood and then once they're out in the ocean and how that can be an astronomically higher cost. Mm -hmm. So what we've got here, um, I'll, I'll flip through a few slides here as we kind of open the panel up. Um, keep, keep those questions coming. We, we are um, not going to be able to get to all of the questions um, today uh, live, but you'll see some and we'll, we'll, we'll post these as part of the webinar resources, the questions and answers that our panelists have put in there. So do put your questions and keep those coming. Um, our panelists will be answering those and continuing to answer those, and we will address the most upvoted uh, questions. So, um, Brad, another uh, another uh, thing that we wanted to talk about is this term uh, gross pollutants. So when we trap the gross pollutants versus the microplastics, and we'll have Brad Seaway in on this definition as well, we asked everybody that, that definition. So just so we're all on the same page and, you know, so we can see that there's not necessarily uh, agreement uh, on all of these categories, uh, let, let's define gross pollutants. When you have a GPT, um, uh, that, that traps gross pollutants. Uh, what are we talking about? Um, when, when we hear the word gross, we think, oh, yuck, I grew up in <laughs> Germany. Gross means large in, in German, um, but uh, gross being yuck and large here is the same thing. Um, what, what, what are we talking about and what's that lower limit uh, on the technical definition of a gross pollutant? Yeah, look, gross is still pretty yucky. Uh, so you're showing some images inside what we call gross pollutant traps. But uh, to define the term, yeah, gross pollutants is generally uh, debris that's five millimetres, like a cigarette butt or bigger. Uh, in other parts of the world, we're often referred to as macroplastics. Uh, so b b smaller than that uh, is often called microplastics. But yeah, so these these gross pollutant traps, and there's all shapes and sizes and, and configurations, including this uh, at-source scully pit basket, um, they are primarily targeting uh, the removal of gross pollutants. So these devices intercept stormwater runoff um, and in doing so intercept a whole bunch of pollution, not just gross pollutants, but a whole bunch of sediment and other attached particles. So I'll give you an example, this image here, this is actually the contents, what we pulled out of eight of those very small gully pit baskets. So gully pits are everywhere uh, and generally water drains uh, you know, off the road into these gully pits, into a pipe and into a, a waterway. Um, but we can actually intercept uh, that stormwater runoff by putting in those little gully pit baskets. And this is what we pulled out of just eight eight gully pit baskets in a typical Western Sydney street. Uh, and they were in the ground for about five months. And it gives you an idea of what we pulled out of these assets. So a whole bunch of single-use plastics, you know, cigarette butts, basically the same stuff that I'm sure Kathy finds in her marine debris uh, surveys on beaches and et cetera, if you're ever doing beach cleanups or whatever. It's generally the same types of plastic, and there's a reason for that because what is going into our oceans and waterways and beaches is is from often land. So, yeah, cigarette butts, uh, single-use plastics, straws, cans, plastics, and a whole bunch of sediment. And that sediment you don't want to put on your garden uh, or at least your veggie garden, uh, it often contains a whole bunch of uh, attached pollutants, including microplastics and heavy metals. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, how about the term nanoplastics? Brad C., um, we had a little bit of a discussion about this. Can you help us um, with that definition? Um, so we, we, we heard that threshold there, five millimeters. So um, for those in, uh, in, in, in the U.S., uh, you might think in, uh, in, in terms of inches. But uh, again, we're talking you know, some, something that, uh, that you could see and, 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 and pick out of the water. There's a lot of stuff you can't see. Um, do you have a threshold then for nanoplastics versus microplastics? Yeah, so the, the scientific consensus really is that a microplastic is less than five millimetres and it would run down to one micro, micrometre. Um, that definition sort of became uh, based upon our ability really to measure it. And, and really when the field sort of started, microplastics were really talking about production pellet nurdles. That was really where the scientific community focused in on. And now we're about two to three mils in size. Now, the difficulty in nanoplastics is our techniques for measuring them really don't work very well underneath for about, say, 10 to 20 micrometers. Mm -hmm. And so a nanoplastic really is in the nanometer size range, so less than one micrometer, but we don't really have very good techniques for monitoring and measuring those, uh, those size plastics. Okay. Kathy, we talk about the beaches, and I think your work has been primarily focused on uh, on beach cleanup efforts. Are we talking microplastics, gross pollutants? Um, what's the typical pollutant that you see, uh, the particle sizes that you see when you're cleaning up on uh, on the beaches? And would we know 
if we had microplastics and nanoplastics, uh, if we had an issue there? Yeah, so our surveys uh, involved anything that you could see with your eye standing upright and looking down. So we sometimes might be able to uh, recognize a bright, maybe red piece of plastic that might be about five mil, but we're mostly looking at these macro litter. So similar to what Brad would be finding in stormwater drains. Um, so yeah, big bottles, chip packets, all these kind of single use items. Um, but there has been some work as well, looking at microplastics um, along Australian beaches. There's a um, really great work by Ausmap who are doing some fantastic work trying to actually quantify how much microplastic is there. But of course, you know, we're finding all this macro litter and if it's left on the beach, it's eventually going to become microplastics. So yeah. that's one of our biggest concerns. Okay, well, when I heard about OzMap, um, and we've got a few people uh, from OzMap um, att attending um, in, the, in the background, um, I, I thought maybe this is a mapping service. Um, can you tell us map? Uh, what, what's the map for in OzMap? Uh... For me? Did you... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a microplastics uh, assessment. So they're training people all around Australia, um, choosing a, one of their local beaches, and they're going out, I think, think it possibly is once a month, maybe once every three months. And they're going out and all doing um, the same type of microplastic survey and collecting all those microplastics. They send them back into the team who verify whether they yes are plastics. And um, I think OSMAP would have to <laughs> give you the results from that, but it's a oh, really it. it's a really exciting way because um, if you just get a research team to try and do that, it's uh, just logistically impossible and so what's really exciting is they're getting um, people all around Australia getting involved in the science and that's a really fantastic yeah. thing yeah Awesome. Well, thanks for some of the questions that have been coming through. Um, Bo has posted some links here to those who are looking for uh, some of his videos. Um, uh, Captain Moore, I see that you've, you've um, got one here that you said you wanted to answer live. So if you can, uh, and for any of the presenters, if you can restate the question, since those watching the recording won't see that um, uh, the, the written question, just go ahead and restate that. So um, over, over to you, Captain Moore. I'll keep just shuffling through some slides in the background um, uh, while, while you address that question. Well, can, can we have the, the question? Because uh, I've been answering several questions. Um, which was, what was the question? Oh, uh, let's see here. There's one that uh, we said, you said you wanted to answer live. So let's just check that uh, here. Um, it kind of disappeared. I was trying to type it, but it came up live. So I'm happy um, to answer either way, but um, yeah. I just don't remember which one it was because I've had about four I've answered already. Yeah. All right, let me just uh, go here and see if I can check the answer. Um, actually, Brad, Brad, while I'm looking for that one, Brad, you said there was one that you wanted to answer live here that says in the background about the the young engineer and some uh, uh, emerging technologies. And I'll yeah, come back look, to I you. actually was just going to type an answer because I uh, didn't actually see it myself. But uh, thank you, uh, Craig. Yeah. So the question is, as a young engineer, this is from Harrison. Uh, as a young engineer who works in infrastructure, particularly stormwater management what are some of the emerging technologies I should be pushing forward to address plastics in stormwater runoff? Look, I think um, I showed some, I think Craig showed some examples of gross pollutant traps, which are effective at removing uh, macroplastics and uh, a lot of sediment as well. Certainly the um, the, the gully, pit, gully pit inserts um, are highly effective at removing uh, macroplastics and microplastics in particular. Very simple at source, um, very easily to maintain these assets in particular. Um, and look, full disclosure, my company does, does sell them, but there are other suppliers who you can get these sort of technologies from. Um, so, But I think anything that essentially intercepts stormwater, now whether that's a, a, a manufactured device like a gross pollutant trap or a gully pit basket, or some sort of bioretention system or swale, if you can essentially just intercept the flow of water through some way, whether it's a screen, a, 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 a gross pollutant trap, or a mesh uh, filter bag, or a bioretention system or a wetland, that'll significantly reduce the, the, the conveyance of plastics into downstream environments. The advantages, I guess, of some of these um, more structural devices like the GPTs and gully baskets is that they are very easily to remove that pollution. And that's the key thing. Infrastructure, just putting in infrastructure isn't going to solve this problem at all. Um, but you do, these assets have to be managed. These the, the accumulated pollution within these assets, such as this is a, a, a CDS 
or a continuously deflective uh, um, uh, separation unit which uses centrifugal forces to remove uh, gross pollutants and other uh, pollution, the pollution has to be physically removed every so often. Now, every three to six to 12 months, but it has to be uh, managed appropriately. But fundamentally, like the, I know there's a lot of focus on stormwater. And look, I work for a storm management company, so I obviously can talk about this underwater. But fundamentally, we are just... Um, a small part of the overall waste management hierarchy. Key initiatives that are far more effective and far cheaper are basically stopping pollution, uh, like essentially avoiding, reusing, recycling, all that sort of stuff. Stormwater treatment, yeah, it's a great sort of final lifeguard, but certainly we need to put uh, greater emphasis on sort of upstream uh, uh, practices as well. Okay. Well, no, th thanks for that. Okay. I took your slide here and just um, let me know if this, if, if I've done something cor correctly in, in your opinion here um, and uh, uh, Captain Moore as well, it, you know, yeah. these, these are the individual, this is the hierarchy. And as we get out here, you talked about um, Captain Moore, you talked about this last chance down here. Yeah. Um, I've added <laughs> this to it, um, some dollar signs. Once we get out into these efforts, and I know there are people out there who um, want to take the ships out into the open ocean and collect uh, collect things out there and then bring them back and recycle them or dispose of them on shore. Once that's out there, um, I would say you've got an order of magnitude more cost associated for each ton of plastic yeah. than if you captured it uh, before it ever got there. So I've I've added these dollar signs to it, um, Captain Moore. Uh, you think that's that's yeah. that's accurate? Yeah, the inverted triangle is true for for many uh, efforts, uh, and and that reminded me of the question that I I, I failed to answer uh, yes. uh, orally uh, was. Which is more important, uh, stopping uh, plastic in runoff or stopping uh, pollutants uh, in runoff, like uh, pesticides, herbicides, uh, endocrine disruptors, um, uh, anything uh, toxic? And uh, the question was, which would be more important? In the short term, it, it may be more important to deal with these uh, pesticides and pollutants, but in the long term, we have to think plastic because uh you know i don't know if you know the rubber ducky guy curtis ebbesmeyer who uh studied uh nike spills from container ships and found that the left shoe would wash up on one beach and the right shoe would wash up on another and he started having beachcomber fares so he could put the two together because just a small thing like the difference in uh, a, a shoe being a left shoe or a right shoe makes the ocean uh, drift to different parts. It, it's, it, I think that's one of the reasons why we believe that uh, 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 organisms became more successful if they had a right and left-handed version of themselves uh, because they were more widely distributed in the ocean. But uh, the, the, what Ebbesmeyer says is uh, uh, an oil spill versus a plastic spill, uh, one to 10, what's worse, an oil spill or a plastic spill? And he gave uh, an oil spill a three and a plastic spill a nine. And the reason for that was that within decades, uh, an oil spill will be biodegraded. It has organisms uh, that will uh, break down the petroleum. It is, after all, uh, a naturally occurring compound. Synthetic polymers are nowhere occur naturally in nature. They're food that nature can't digest. And because of that, they last a long, long time compared to pollutants. and not only do they last as polymers, they become hydrophobic uh, and any pollutant that is hydrophobic, which is most of your pesticides and herbicides. After all, when you spray something, you don't want it to wash off the leaf right away. You want it to hang on. So they're water repellent and all these pollutants preferentially stick to plastic. Plastic is lipophilic. It loves oily pollutants. It sticks to them. So here we have these poison pills lasting for not just decades. Sylvia Earle said if uh, the Mayflower had landed on Plymouth Rock with plastic dinnerware, we'd still be finding traces of it on the beaches of the Atlantic. So uh, we think a plastic spill is an order of magnitude worse than a pollutant spill. Interesting. And we get those spills every day. 
um, you know, from some of these rivers. I'll, I'll, I'll go back to um, just an image here to just uh, facilitate a bit of the discussion and um, recognizing that some may need to run on the hour. Um, I, I, I do want to, um, you know, take advantage of the time that we've got here with, uh, with our panelists. Um, so we will probably run over a bit here because I see a lot of questions coming in. There's a lot of interest. If you do need to run, you'll get the recording link emailed to you. Um, I'd, I'd like to continue this discussion a bit if those um, on, on the call are able to stay. Um, I'd like to get your thoughts on uh, something like this. Um, and, and I think, Brad, we've had a couple of discussions about that. We showed some of the, uh, some of the um, stormwater treatment mechanisms at a smaller scale um, that might filter some of these smaller uh, rivers. Um, in, in this one, um, courtesy of the ocean cleanup um, that, uh, um, that, that, that goes out into the, into the ocean, into the gyres to, to uh, attempt to clean, clean things up there. They also have the, these uh, interceptors in place. And this one went pretty viral um, because of, I, I think, just the, the shock of seeing this. I mean, if you've been in Guatemala, I was just there uh, just pre-COVID, um, and there's some beautiful spots there, but I also saw some waterways that were highly degraded. Um, and just, again, having a look at this, what's, what's on the YouTube video called the plastic tsunami, um, is, is shocking. Um, and, and, you know, everybody looks at this and says, wow, we ought to do something about it. And yeah, I mean, look at if you look at what's there, and if we trap it there, and if you were able to go in and pull this out, um, you know, how much easier is it to do it right there than once it's out in the ocean and broken into trillions and trillions of pieces, um, trying to clean it up somewhere else? But I guess my my thoughts on this one is like, well, you know, uh, how much effort can go into even before it gets to this point? You know, is it too late by the time we get here? Um, Brad, when you talk about filtering, direct versus indirect filtering, um, any any thoughts on uh, what councils and industry, you know, we've got hundreds or thousands, you know, thousands watching this in the end of water professionals who have the capacity to make a difference in the industry. You know, what should we be investing in? Uh, as our last chance to get this out before it's out there streaming around in the in the gyres. Well, the the, the, the sort of I think it's called the intercept uh, fence trash yep. or trash fence or something mm -hmm. is just a bad technology. Uh, it, it's it's a technology that's been around for probably 30, 40 years. It's essentially just a direct screen, like what we call a trash rack. They've just given it a nice badge and and showed some imagery long story short they just are very very ineffective they blind they block they cause upstream flooding uh and look that it looks really impressive on a youtube video but uh unfortunately it's far more effective to stop pollution at the source again the uh, the avoiding you know the banning of single-use plastics would be the best thing that these areas could do certainly far more effective to ban single-use plastics invest in sort of waste management or waste uh, minimization uh, facilities and recycling facilities far more effective than spending money on on some rubbish um, trash fence simply okay same. well was, i've got a couple of smaller scale images here of trying to yeah. trap these things and what happens when you start cramming material into the grates uh, I, but again when we look at this and we see it floating past and the next stop is out in the ocean gyre it, you want to stop it. You want to do something about it. Um, and, and, you know, there are people who are, are trying uh, and sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. The technology is emerging. Um, any, any lessons learned um, from these sorts, you know, we, we've got engineers, we've got modelers, uh, we've got people who can put these things together into, uh, you know, even CFD models and show what happens to these, uh, the particles. Um, any lessons learned on uh, screening and filtering to try yeah. to prevent this from yeah. entering the ocean? There you go, Charles. There, there is no way to stop the power of the ocean uh, in any stream as it accumulates uh, mass and velocity. Uh, there is no structural defense that will uh, defend against the power of water. I mean, just look at the hurricanes we've just experienced here in Florida. Uh, everything is uh, tossed about, whether it's uh, 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 any, any, any heavy material like water that is flowing at a rapid rate. When it builds up and creates uh, a tremendous force, you cannot build anything uh, that will stop it. And, you know, I mean, that's what a dam is, all right? But that's a hugely engineered structure that releases a lot of water. 
The idea is if you could release the water from this uh, and remove the trash, that would be great. There you see water being released, but when that builds up, that's a very small flow compared to the total flow of water reaching there. It eventually overtops the, the screening device because the screening device becomes solid. It becomes yes. just like a dam and, and you get over the dam dam. Yeah, and that's, again, we, we've got, we've got um, on, as part of our subscribers, we know when we do these modeling exercises, we've got some of the best hydraulic modelers in the world. Um, who come to these webinars put your thinking caps on let's go to work let's figure something out you know there may be products now where when we have a webinar like this 10 years from now somebody hadn't thought of something some way to uh you know to, to help that does doesn't have um as, as many disadvantages and so in that regard uh and for the benefit of the modelers here we've got uh, from our friends at flow 3d a couple of um uh animations here showing that you know we can model some of these uh uh, pollutants, some of these, uh, whether they're plastics or any other contaminants, um, we can model them as individual particles. We can model them by concentration. We can show, like with these dams, you know, how much uh, silt or debris or whatever it is, um, you know, even the floating particles uh, will build up behind due to the water's energy. We can understand what water does. Physics is physics. Um, we, when we have a look at some of these things, um, you know, can we come up with better mechanisms uh, to protect our waterways. Um, so that's, uh, you know, that, these are just some things, again, that I'll have running in the background. Uh, final one that I'll, that I'll show here, because it got a lot of attention in, uh, in Australia, um, is this one here called the, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a, a drain sock. Um, Brad uh, D, any, any comments on the efficacy of these? Um, again, some of these videos will go viral and say, look, hey, this is awesome. Um, wh what are your thoughts on this sort of a solution? Yeah, look. Uh, again, I don't want to be a doomsday, but it's, it's generally pretty ineffective. Uh, again, it's great visual, great visually. Uh, it shows the pollution and the types of pollution and how we should be stopping it further upstream. But as a as a device, you can see it's very difficult to manage and maintain. Difficult to uh, difficult to remove that pollution once it's been accumulated. These nets often snap off after they've reached their capacity, which they're actually designed to do. Generally, have a very limited capacity. Most of the pollution that they'll retain will be organic matter, as you can see, which is still can, can contain a whole bunch of microplastics as well. But there are far better options than this. Uh, if, you, <laughs> if you if you if you're solely looking at stormwater treatment assets, there's a, a whole bunch of other technologies that are far more effective. But I've seen this image uh, on. on social media and people go oh this is amazing what they're doing in australia it's been around for about 20 30 years it's not new and we've certainly moved on and innovated since this yeah i'm a hydraulic modeler and when i do my culvert models with um exit and entrance losses and you know uh, debris and friction and blockage and things like that it's like whoa uh, this is a flood modeler's nightmare mm -hmm. um but again you know uh, what, what what are you going to do um trying trying to get these things out of here um so yeah, we, let's have some creative ideas there. I want to go around to each of the panelists here and give give everybody uh, initially um, uh, the chance to answer a a question or two that you've addressed on the uh, Q and A line, and then we'll have closing remarks at the end um, where I want to I'll, I'll ask the question I'll already tell you in advance. The question will be: Are you optimistic? So uh, let's go to uh, Brad C and then to uh, Kathy. Um, if, if there are questions, uh, if just so select a question or two from the uh, Q and A line, and just uh, let us know your response to it. The the question I'll uh, the the most easiest way to solve this problem, as with most pollution, is actually source control. And so, having engineered solutions is really, as you've talked about, is much more expensive when it gets into the rivers and the oceans than rather than just simply not using them in the first place. As an example, I was at the supermarket yesterday, and uh, the shopper in front of me wanted to put her bananas in a plastic bag. What is the point of that? There's no reason to do it. So we can quickly modify people's behavior. In actual fact, it's the same for all chemical pollution as well. Um, you know, and I'm not sure if it's particularly useful to be ranking whether like one talk type of environmental degradation is more important or harmful than another. Um, you know, whether it's nutrient runoff or pesticides or plastics, the thing is about the um, pollution actually is one of the largest causes of um, premature death of people globally. And we should be mindful of um, that. The reason that plastics in particular resonates with people is because we can see it. 
but chemicals are often an invisible source of uh, very destructive health consequences. And will um, particularly things like uh, PFAS will persist in our environment potentially forever. That carbon fluorine bond doesn't break down. Um, and I unfortunately have to go to go as well. I'm one of those ones that has an hour. So yep. uh, great to be part of the panel and it was really informative. Thanks so much, Brad. Um, we'll uh, we'll stay in touch and we'll we'll post any of your answers that you've put here in writing. So thanks so much, uh, Kathy. In case you need to run as well, let's um, have you um, uh, offer your uh, insights into some of the questions that you've addressed. Yeah, I was going to answer one question, and it's one that often pops up in panels like this, which is why is a focus typically on consumer and not the producer when it comes to recycling, reducing. And shouldn't the focus be on business to stop selling products that damage the environment? And this definitely comes up all the time. Um, you hear from plastic industry, they're the ones that actually funded those famous littering commercials that you see, which is do the right thing, put it in the bin, and putting that onus back on the consumer. But um, now, now things, you know, Consumers are coming, becoming more aware of this, but from, a, I guess, the plastic producer's point of view, it's actually cheap for them to, you know, the price of oil at the moment means it's still cheap for them to produce plastic, and that's what their market and business is. So there's no incentive for them uh, from a market point of view to reduce their product um, available to consumers. But uh, what's really nice is... Um, you know, as a consumer, we, our hands are kind of tied with what products we can buy. I mean, if our products are always in plastic, then, um, you know, we can't put necessarily the consumer demand on it. But what's really nice as a consumer, as um, a voter, we can actually put pressure on our government because they're actually the ones that um, do have some power in terms of legislating what products can be made available into um, our market and so putting pressure on them uh, is actually something that uh, has tangible and uh, an effect rather than um, necessarily always uh, putting pressure on um, industry because they don't necessarily have any incentive other than um, you know being being <laughs> doing the good thing I guess Thanks. so yeah yeah no, I really appreciate your insights on that. Um, that's uh, yeah, and and thanks for the answers that have come in through the Q and A line as well, and for your participation on the panel. Uh, Bo Miles, um, you, you've passed some of these links along. We're hoping to add some subscribers uh, to your channel as well um, through this uh, webinar and um, through these. Uh, um, out, outreach efforts here. Um, if you could, uh, you know, if, if there's anything that you've seen on here um, during this discussion uh, that you wanted to highlight um, based on some of the uh, the responses uh, that I've seen you put on the uh, on the chat line, uh, we just wanted to give you a chance to, uh, yeah, to offer any any insights from your, uh, on your upcoming uh, webinars coming up, make a plug for your, uh, your new videos and maybe a plug for uh, having fewer sick rivers in the future to, to feature. I hope that's the case, Craig. Uh, you know, your your question earlier that you're going to end everyone on is 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 there is optimism an option? Uh, I hope it is, and I must admit, and I know there's some there's some wacky research out there that says that we reach our optimistic status quo when we're 35. I think it is. That's that's kind of where you're at for the rest of your life. Um, I, I I mean, of course, there's hope, and of course, we will make innovations. But our trouble too is that um, there's just so many of us, and uh, you know, the pessimist in me does emerge when I just realise how many humans are on on Earth and how uh, it's just so easy. You know, I'm, it's still so easy to buy something made in plastic when you stop at the service station and you're hungry and something that is there for ninety five cents and you just buy it. And, I, and I'm trying to stop myself all the time for this stuff, but plastic is still part of my life and I consider myself someone who's pretty, who's pretty uh, cutthroat with my decision-making sometimes with how I try and help the earth or help biodiversity. So it's bloody hard. It's bloody hard. So I don't know where my pessimism lies. Um, my films kind of explore that. Look, I mean, if people want to watch my YouTube stuff, fantastic. But otherwise, you know, I'm kind of overwhelmed with... Uh, just how how much this stuff can dictate our day um, and how much it should, in a sense. Yeah, thanks. So, that, um, Captain Moore, um, optimism, uh, pessimism, uh, what's your outlook on, on the future? Do we have the collective willpower, you know, to, to do – I mean, 
uh, sometimes it, it looks a little bit futile to go out there and screen the top level. And I guess we haven't really uh, addressed that um, question. Um, uh, how much of the ocean plastics are in that top layer? How much, if you looked at that vertical water, water column, um, is actually available for you to screen off the top? And how much of it is just circulating around and will just keep uh, re reappearing? Are you optimistic about the future of us being able to make a dent uh, in the oceans? Uh no, I, I'm not optimistic <laughs> at all about any kind of a, a cleanup uh, at all. Uh, it, it, people don't get the scale of the ocean. The ocean is much larger than the land. Imagine vacuuming all the land, cleaning up all the plastic off the surface of the earth. Uh, that would only be one third of the surface of the ocean. Uh, the ocean is two thirds of the surface area. And then that's just the surface. This stuff mixes completely into the water column. We already talked about settling and how fouling uh, changes the, the density of the plastic uh, as it becomes smaller and it begins to settle out into the, into the benthos. And, and that will be there until it's subducted under the lithosphere and becomes part of the magma and then re-erupts in some volcano. So uh, this is not something that is going to be done in any civilization uh, yet to be born. Uh, but uh, in order not to uh, leave you completely pessimistic uh, and, and uh, tragically so, so that you might want to consider doing some harm uh, in order just to avoid uh, uh, the situation, uh, let's think about what's possible now in the metaverse. Uh, you know, Engineers can model, engineers can build, but engineers can't see the future. And now the future can be seen by virtually everyone that has internet. And if the metaverse gets good at becoming the modeler of the future, and we begin to see ourselves as animals that can live happy, free, productive lives with food, shelter, clothing, and energy in abundance without polluting, there is a possibility that we can have a radical reset on the trajectory of Western and Eastern civilization now that they're united and becoming part of the growth economy, which is not a circular economy. The growth economy is a linear economy. Growth is the enemy of circularity. Circularity is the natural state of nature in which there is decay and there is regeneration. And if we can begin to see that in the metaverse, if we can see ourselves creating that ideal natural circular economy visually so that everyone in civilization realizes that their polyester fleece is contributing to pollution and they can get rid of it, then we have a possibility of creating that civilization, which would be the break with the past. And that is the only real solution, is a radical break from the linearity of the past to the circularity of the future. Oh, thanks. And that's why we put in the description of the webinar, you know, this webinar is intended to change your life um, or at least your lifestyle. So having seen what you've seen here, we're hoping that we get some other activists out of this. Yes, we've got modelers and scientists who can help, uh, you know, develop products and innovative things, um, but also as a consumer. Um, can we help push some of these initiatives, recognizing the damage that's done? And that drop in the bucket, and I just, you know, I did some calculations here. You know, I, th I think a, a water drop, it might be about a 20th of a millimeter. You know, when you when you do your COVID test and you drip it in there, you know, they know exactly how many milliliters uh, that is. Um, you know, about a 20th is a drop. And if you look at the average bucket being, you know, I don't know, 20, uh, 20 liters or so in a bucket, Literally, uh, the drop in the bucket, if you're out there doing these ocean cleanup efforts where you're skimming the top three meters, um, it's a thousand uh, square kilometers um, before you've even reached that drop in a bucket stage. Now, that said, yeah. at least at least there's awareness being raised. I mean, I see this as kind of a, a hacksaw ridge analogy. You know, people say, I don't know if you've seen that movie, uh, a guy goes up there and he's just, uh, you know, grabbing one person at a time. 
And, you know, that's not the problem. The problem is people are shooting at each other, you know. And, yeah, let's go back and solve world politics. Let's get world peace going. Let's get, you know, why is this person out there grabbing one person at a time? You know, I'd rather see a ship out there, you know, in the middle of the ocean collecting something uh, than a ship out there launching uh, ballistics at the at the neighboring country. You know, we, we have the collective willpower to go out there and assemble some massive infrastructure. Maybe in the end we'll have the collective willpower to do something about this problem. But I do want to highlight, if you're out there, there in a uh, you know in a river um, like like this you know if you grab it there before it gets out into the ocean um, you've saved yourself uh, you know ten times a hundred times the cost of trying to deal with the problem yeah. elsewhere so let's get it at the source uh, and go from there yeah. um, uh, any, any other comments on that uh, uh, zero waste is the key we haven't mentioned the term zero waste but zero waste is a movement. Zero Waste is uh, having a big conference now in Italy, another one in Brazil. Uh, there is no such thing as waste. This stuff that you're seeing there is not waste. These are resources waiting to be recovered. And uh, if we have 100% resource recovery, then we will have zero waste and we'll be on our way to a better future, a circular economy. So let's just think about creating the mechanisms that will create zero waste in our economy that's yeah. the key yeah and and right now the products and the labor you know those costs are out of out of whack a, a thousand years from now it can't be anymore you it can't be cheaper for me I, I took a refrigerator i was about to chuck it out and somebody luckily uh with some no know-how fixed this little tiny part and I didn't have to th toss this massive refrigerator. If the labor for fixing things is uh, cheaper than the cost of just getting something new and making everything disposable, um, then then we'll start to to, to make, make some change. And we've done this with water recycling. I mean, people said 20 years ago, this could never be done. And now you look at almost every drop of water that goes in some of these communities in Las Vegas and elsewhere. Um, because it's such a valuable resource, they'll treat it, they'll pump it back up, and they'll sell it to you again. It makes sense not to waste it. And this is going to happen to our resources as well. It'll make sense uh, not to waste them. Brad Absolutely. D., um, uh, optimism. Uh, I, I saw your, your last uh, episode, and I do want to make sure that we uh, give people these links uh, to the podcast and, um, and to your webinars here uh, to, to, to watch these and listen to them. When you're at the gym, uh, you know, in, instead of, or, or in the car, you know, instead of listening to just the next tune that you've already heard, um, listen to this stuff. It, it, it will change your life. Your presentation that you did last week, I encourage everybody to watch that. These slides that you've seen today, courtesy of uh, Brad and Ocean Protection. Protect. Um, thanks for those. I encourage everybody to watch those. When you put those slides in, the one I didn't put was the one at the end that said hope. Um, do you have hope for the future uh, in this regard? Do I have hope? Yes. Look, it is easy to be despondent about the plight of our oceans and waterways and how much plastic is in them. But now more than ever, we need stubborn optimism. Uh, if I look back 2,500 years ago, Siddhartha Gautama, the, the man who became known as Buddha, said, the brightness of mind is the final goal of enlightenment, but it is also the first step. Without a bright mind, you cannot make progress. You cannot proceed. And we need the brightest of minds to help protect our oceans and waterways from this scourge of plastic pollution. And ultimately, we are the weavers of the tapestry of history you know when we look back at great moments of history when the human race was called on to make you know uh, come to come to uh, i guess a huge challenge uh, we naturally think that if if we were in those positions if i think of braveheart fighting the english or the french revolution or the fields of gallipoli we naturally feel as though we would have made the noble decision we would have done the right thing as opposed to stumbling along doing nothing well, this is our chance. We are have the outrageous fortune to be on this planet in this moment of time with this knowledge and this understanding of this issue and this opportunity to solve this problem. And I have every confidence in the world that with the likes of Captain Charles Moore, Kathy Willis, Cray Price, Brad Clark, Bo Miles, and a thousand other people all listening on all this podcast and webinar, et cetera, I know we will actually rise to the challenge and actually appropriately address this problem. But it, it, it's not something that we can just you know, handball to government or rely on some sort of fancy technology or just someone else. This is an everyone, everywhere mission. that, And we all need to collectively 
and effectively act on this issue. And I know we will. Yeah. Perfect. And uh, if you if if you would like to applaud there, and I would love to uh, applaud here, and we'd have a round of applause going around with the, you know thousands of people who will watch this video in the end. Um, you know, have a, have a listen then um, to Brad interviewing. You know, with that same eloquence, um, interviewing a hundred different um, leading scientists and researchers. Um, I think you do that as a volunteer. Nobody's paying you to do your podcast. This is a passion that uh, you know has led into a career. But the broadcasting of these ideas is something that uh, comes comes from the heart. If you want to hear a uh, hundred different podcasts uh, with a hundred different uh, scientists who are experts in their field, uh, go go to that website website and uh and listen in um kathy uh any closing remarks uh, in terms of your your optimism for the future well, i'm very optimistic if i wasn't i probably wouldn't be doing the work i'm doing um i think this is a really tangible um thing that we can solve i mean we've all got hands we've all we all can make really positive decisions and so i think it's now it's just like brad said having really firm optimism and really um, really pushing our governments and our plastic industry to um, making these really positive changes. I think it's really exciting the different uh, product alternatives that are out there now that could be replacing the role of single-use plastics when and where they're necessary. And I think it's just us trying to really think about do we need these things covered in plastic and how we... Um, value our plastic as well because at the moment we view it as this disposable commodity but really it has a lot of value and we just have to think about how we're using it thanks all right well thanks so much uh, to the panelists um uh, charles uh, Ca captain moore um i, I will come I, i'll take you up on your offer i'm gonna, I'll, I'll i'll come come see you in a couple weeks um and uh next uh ne next next month um we're going to be doing a webinar on um uh, on urban river restoration. I'm going to go out to the LA River and have a look at what happened to the restoration plans that we had for it 20 years ago when I was working as a, as a consultant there um, and see, have we made, have we made a dent there? And is our water, our, is our waterway health um, any, any better? Um, you'll see a couple of uh, links here on some of the additional uh, material that we've got available to you um, through the Australian Water School uh, courses and webinars. Um, there'll be one on coral reefs in December to round out our year what's uh and and a lot of what we talked about today is relevant to that discussion uh next year is up in the air meaning I, we're planning it um we can still slot in some things based on your feedback so thanks so much to our presenters our panelists thanks for these slides in the background that you see let's do something about this let's let's mobilize all of the uh knowledge and uh brain power that we have and collective willpower to make a difference politically in our daily lives as consumers and in our careers careers as water professionals. So from the Australian Water School and on behalf of the International Water Training Institute, thanks so much for your attendance. We look forward to your participation in some of our future uh, episodes going forward. We will see you next time. Thanks for watching. Subscribe by clicking the link below and click on the notification bell to stay up to date with new releases. For the latest in significant, innovative and critical advances in water science, technology and management, subscribe now to build your skills, enhance your technical knowledge and learn from leading experts in water, visit the australianwaterschool.com.au and discover our online training courses, both live and on demand.